My name is uh, Jack Smellian, and I'm at uh, St. Louis University uh, with the Bomb Lab. And uh, we have been working in collaboration with the Burke Lab for some time on these uh, FAD binding aptamers, uh, or FAD binding RNA aptamers, uh, that increase, potentially can increase the, uh, the redox potential of the bound uh, flavin. Um, so I guess for starters, just give a little bit of background, although not so much uh, because I feel like a lot of people are adequate with this. Uh, what we're following here is uh, RNA world hypothesis in that um, before present day cells with RNA, DNA, and uh, proteins, uh, there was a simpler system in which RNA could have um, contributed to being both the genetic material and also have catalytic function. Um, and also, I also put the, uh, the peptides in that little protocell there, uh, just to show that there might have been peptides around, but not necessarily uh, formed from the RNA at that time. Um, some evidence of this is the uh, ribonucleotide cofactors that we see today. So all these cofactors, FAD, NAD, um, and then uh, coenzyme A, they all have the adenosine uh, portion in it, which is ribonucleotide cofactor. Um, it's kind of like a prehistoric fossil, if you will, of the RNA world. Um, current cells and uh, proteins use these cofactors in order to uh, metabolize reactions. So they uh, um, essentially, what they do is they have differential binding towards either the oxidized or reduced form of these cofactors. And in doing so, they can uh, vary the redox potential of that cofactor in order to carry out uh, a wide variety of metabolic reactions and so. And, uh, so the, the idea behind this project is that uh, if proteins can do it and, and really uh, utilize the variability that comes with changing the redox potential, can RNA also do the same thing? Because that would be extremely beneficial uh, to really kind of pushing forward uh, with the RNA and, uh, and how it uh, evolves from just you know, simply binding things to, uh, to actually catalyzing reactions and such. Um, so the selections, I'm just going to go through really briefly because this was done well before I was even an undergrad. Um, but the Burke group identified uh, a handful of RNA aptamers that preferentially bind to the oxidized FAD over the reduced FADH2. Um, <clears throat> as you can see here, so this is just an inline probing gel. Uh, if you don't know what it is, uh, essentially if the band is dark here, that indicates that the RNA took on a different structure. Um, in that confirmation, and whenever it was cleaved, it took that on. Um, so in this lane right here is the oxidized FAD, and then here is the reduced FADH2. And you can see that at similar concentrations, we have different cleaving patterns, which indicates different confirmation of the RNA. That shows that the, this RNA aptamer is preferentially binding to the oxidized FAD over the reduced FADH2. And, and just through inline probing, uh, they got rough um, uh, dissociation constants of about 30 micromolar for the oxidized FAD and greater than 500 micromolar for the uh, the reduced form. Now they're not, you know, super precise numbers, but there's a there's a clear distinction that uh, the, these aptamers preferentially binds the oxidized form over the reduced form. <clears throat> so now this is where uh, I took over. Um, we decided. Uh, to first look at UV vis of this. So what I have up here is structures of FAD and then three, uh, three RNA aptamers that bind to FAD. Uh, this X2B2 right here was the one from the previous slide. So this is the one that preferentially binds to the oxidized flavin over the reduced. Uh, this F test one down here is a, another one from the Burke lab. Uh, they found that there was no uh, difference between the oxidized and reduced binding. And then this 27 FAD1 up here, uh, the Burke Lab, originally it was proposed to be an FAD aptamer, but they found that it actually is more than likely actually binding to the adenine uh, portion of FAD. Uh, so we had three RNA aptamers that we wanted to look at. And looking at UV-Vis, we see that once you mix together the FAD and the RNA, um, the ones that bind to this uh, uh, isooloxazine ring system here actually shift uh, the UV vis spectra of this. And uh, you know, this is indicative of you know, hydrogen bonding or ionic effects on the different faces of FAD. Um, but really some important parts is that this, the X2B2 aptamer shifted the maxima from 448 to 456 nanometers. And then there's this uh, presence of a shoulder at 482 nanometers. So we had a good um, 
kind of baseline is to uh, gauge whether or not binding is occurring. So we decided to look at some kind of characteristics of binding with this aptamer. Uh, so a couple of things we looked at is the time that it takes to bind. And uh, it's extremely fast, probably within the order of seconds. This is me just quickly pipetting uh, RNA aptamer into a cuvette and then pressing measure as quickly as I can. And within 20 seconds, we see this full peak shift over to the fully bound form. So really, this, this experiment was probably just diffusion limited as to how quickly it can actually diffuse through, this, through the solution. But uh, we know that it is extremely quick at binding. And uh, we know that this peak shift is indicative of binding because under denaturing conditions, the peak will shift back towards that of free FAD. So if we heat it up, it will shift to free FAD, let it cool down. It will go back to the bound states. And then also eight molar urea et cetera, et cetera. Um, so another thing we looked at was the divalent metal dependence. Uh, so these selections were done with magnesium. So we wanted to see uh, how dependent they were on the divalent metals. And we saw, obviously, with the increasing divalent metals, we get more and more binding. With that, at about 10 uh, millimolar, it kind of maxed out. There was no uh, change in binding there. Uh, so interestingly, I titled this divalent metal dependence instead of magnesium dependence because it also works with manganese, calcium, zinc, and nickel. So all of those divalent metals induce binding. Um, it really didn't matter which one we used. It, they all caused the same uh, amount of binding there. And, th and this was you know, proven where we just add in an excess of EDTA to, to chelate out the divalent metals, and then that would shift it back towards that of free FED. Um, another interesting point is that the binding remained unchanged between pHs 4 and 10. So there was no effect on the, uh, on the, on the peak shifts there between that. And uh, really, uh, that's, that's the range that I put because experiments at pH 3 and lower or pH 11 and higher just degraded the RNA uh, immediately. So really, at the pH ranges where the RNA was happy, it was fully binding uh, with the flavin. And, and again, that's divalent metal dependent at all those pHs. So the next step we took was to do some mutations to kind of uh, gauge where the, uh, <clears throat> which nucleotides were important for binding. So this is the uh, predicted secondary structure. And essentially what we did is we just did some point mutations along these loop regions here. And then uh, some base swaps in the base pairing regions, either constructive or destructive towards the secondary structure. Um, and in short, this is what we saw. So. Red means that that mutation effectively killed the binding. There was no longer any peak shift whenever we introduced it. The blue indicates partial binding, so there was a small peak shift, but not significant to that of the parent uh, aptamer. And then green indicates that there was full binding uh, retained, so they, there was still the full peak shift that was there. And uh, these aren't very interesting because the proposed binding site is up here in these loop regions. Uh, so down here, that's, you know, it doesn't really uh, affect the secondary structure too much. What was really interesting, though, is these two kind of outliers uh, just kind of randomly placed in there. Um, and when looking at the UV vis of each of these mutations, we can see that the uh, L14CU mutation actually shifted the peak a little bit more, and the shoulder's a little bit more pronounced. And then the, uh, the L24 UA mutation, uh, the maxima is about the same, but the shoulder um, here is not as prevalent as that in the mutation. Uh, so now I'll quickly <clears throat> go into how we determine the redox potential of the bound flavin. Uh, so what we used was xanthine, xanthine oxidase redox assay. Uh, it's a uv vis based assay, but in short, xanthine oxidase will catalyze this reaction here. If you remove oxygen from the system and place in a high uh, redox potential dye, like methyl biologin here, it can use the methyl biologin to catalyze the reaction, and then you have this reduced methyl biologin uh, species that's in solution. If you have your flavin and then a redox active dye that you can monitor, uh, the methyl biologin will then go and then react that. Uh, the redox potential dye is known, whereas the flavin is unknown. What we can do is then compare the two Nernst equations uh, with the dye and the flavin to each other. Uh, whenever you plot these log terms against each other, the y-intercept is going to equal the difference in redox potential between the, the dye and the, and the flavin. So, um, so a couple things. One, this has been used on flavoproteins before, but not on aptamers. Um, it's important to pick a redox dye that's 
close in redox potential to that of your flavin, otherwise then uh, the dye can react with the flavin or vice versa. Um, and then essentially, so the absorbance change is uh, how we're going to see that ratio of oxidized to reduced. Uh, so here's what a spectra just kind of looks like as time progresses, <clears throat> the absorbance goes down. So this is FAD uh, with the redox dye anthroquinone 2 sulfonic acid, uh, which is essentially once it gets reduced, it, this starts to come up right here. And, and uh, basically what we do is we pick the uh, isospectus points for each, the redox dye and the FAD. Um, and measure the other one at that point. So essentially an isospectus point is uh, for FAD, no matter what the ratio of oxidized to reduced is, it's, the absorbance is gonna remain exactly the same. So we measured the dye at that location. Uh, so that's just a spectra for that one. And then this is for the aptamer with FAD. I guess just one thing to note is that we still see the characteristic binding uh, peak shifts there. Yeah. Uh, uh, even though uh, throughout the entirety of the, of the reaction going on. So we know that it's still binding uh, with it there. Um, this is just a comparison of the plots just to see kind of how the data is spread and to see how much of a difference there actually was between uh, free FAD here and then the aptamer with FAD. Um, and then this is just the results with the aptamer and then the mutations here. Uh, so what we can see is this F-test 1, which was the aptamer that didn't um, uh, had no preference between the oxidized and reduced flavins, uh, we can see that there was little to no change in the redox potential that was measured of FAD. The X2B2 mutant caused um, negative 12 millivolt shift in redox potential. And then the, uh, the L14CU mutant, which was this one right here, actually doubled that redox shift, so there was a minus 24 millivolt shift in potential. Um, interestingly though, this, this 24 UA mutation actually uh, killed the redox shift. So this one, while it still was binding to FAD, uh, this mutation essentially lost that, uh, that um, distinction between the oxidized and reduced forms of FAD. And so like, just really to kind of point out that the, the aptamer here and then this mutation causes enhanced electron transfer of this. So uh, we essentially, you know, it this shows that the binding of this aptamer changed the redox potential of the of the bound flavin um, compared to you know that in solution and and um, that you know this can kind of really just be or the this is more just beginning um, experiments and whatnot but you can imagine if this is like a component on a ribozyme that can bring in uh, this FAD with with a different redox potential in order to catalyze some kind of reactions. All right. Uh, and then just to finish off, thank St. Louis University, Baum Lab, Burke Lab, University of Missouri, Columbia, and then uh, NASA as well for the funding. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Jack. We have time for maybe one question. Yes, Peter. Does the rate of electron transfer depend on the moves that they're actually using? Um, so the rate, the rate of electron, like how, how long that? How fast does that? Uh, I think you're approaching some kind of equilibrium. Yeah, exactly. So, so actually, how so. Fast, how fast does that equilibrium get approached as a function of the mutant that you use? Right. So the, and you're talking about like the assay essentially that that I was showing. So the assay, um, the actually the idea in order to get um, good results is actually to keep that as slow as possible, and if there is a difference, it will. Uh, show up, and the reason why is because we want the flavin and the dye to be kind of reducing at the same rate. What's going to happen though is when they're not at equilibrium right at the beginning, that's when one is going to kind of take over. Well, if you, if you forget about measuring the equilibrium, how, how fast does the flavin actually get reduced as a function of the, of the new? Um, I mean, I'm not entirely sure. Like, if, if I were just to, like, I mean, it should be pretty quickly if I were just to put, like, a highly reduced species in there, then it, it would be. I mean, I'm just wondering how it couples with the environment. So maybe, maybe the aptamer actually helps it couple, or maybe it protects it from being coupled, right? So therefore, the rate of, the rate of reduction should be related to the mutation that you're making. Um, Right, so actually, you can actually kind of gauge that as to how quickly each species is being reduced by, um, uh, in those plots, whenever you plot them, if it's a slope of one, 
that means everything is reducing at the same rate, which means that if there's not a slope of one, that means something is reducing quicker than the other thing, and it's not a very good uh, test. That it's not really showing what's actually happening. And all these that we did, all the mutants and everything, they all showed a slope of one on that, indicating that everything is, is reducing at the same rate throughout the reaction. Um, so, yeah. All right, thank you, Jack. Thanks.